Hi guys. Today's video is on research. Hopefully by now you've already seen the precursors to this lecture. I'm just gonna share my screen, um, which are the citations video, um, as well as the academic integrity video. And I do suggest checking out my intro to digital editing, as well as my demo on referencing using the Word features, so the referencing tab in Word, um, and my uh, lecture on Word chapter four, which is entirely about the review and reference tabs. All right, um, let's make this full screen and uh, get going. Just gonna move it over, there we go. All right, let's talk research. There are three kind of categories of research which will um, kind of dictate the questions that you're asking and the goals of your research. So the first is applied research. This is research which seeks to solve in a practical problem. So um, I don't know, my ice cream melts too fast, okay? So my applied research would be looking at ice cream melt rates, looking at different contents that you can put into ice cream to stop it from melting so fast. Okay, that would be applied. Then we have qualitative research. This is exploratory research. It's just, you wanna know something, you wanna know more about something, but there isn't necessarily a particular purpose for it. So instead of being like my ice cream melts, I need to solve this issue. It would be more like, I'm interested in the components of ice cream generally. I just wanna know what's in there. <laughs> Weird thing to study, I suppose, but I just wanna know what's in there. Qualitative research is the kind of more academic stuff. Um, and again, it tends not to have necessarily an application right away, but then is used for things later on. This is how a lot of big discoveries are made. And then after the discovery is made, then they figure out how they can use it to better human lives. Finally, we have quantitative research. And this is when you are generating some kind of data about a topic or about a question. So this would be running surveys um, and or just counting people, uh, counting the results for something um, and then kind of crunching those numbers and seeing what comes out of it, what you can figure out, what patterns you can find. Okay. So quantitative is gonna be like surveys, Okay, qualitative is going to be experimental just because you wanna know something and applied means that there's a specific problem that you're trying to solve and then you are looking for uh, practical solutions. So the methods of research, surveys is obviously a quantitative way of researching. Interviews can be used quantitatively or qualitatively. Um, web tools, there's lots now, different programs that can look at different numbers or different types of content um, and give you statistics or information about them. And then case studies, which is where you follow a couple of representative um, situations instead of like a huge sample size. So methodology continued here. Um, there are some different ways that you can look for content. So we're talking mostly here now about media content, written, video, that kind of thing, as opposed to doing active experimentation. So there are general reference works. These are things like dictionaries, thesauruses, encyclopedias. You have specialized reference works. So that would be um, like instead of a regular dictionary, it could be, for instance, the caps and spelling, this guy that I happen to have here. Um, this is a writing guide, a style guide. Um, we're gonna talk about that more. Um, or maybe the APA rules, um, any kind of reference book that is specialized to a specific research field. Electronic catalogs, you can search online for content. We know how to do this, right? It's search engines um, specific to the library usually. And then of course, books, articles, um, all your usual print materials. 
some definitions that we need for doing research and talking about research. First of all, a source. The source or a source, not the source. A source is any piece of media that provides information for your work. So this could be a video you watched, a lecture you heard, a book you read. Okay? This is going to be used to provide evidence for your claims to back up your ideas and to support your arguments. Okay? Also to inform you and to provide good background for your conversations. A database is a collection of media items that can be accessed. So this is typically computer-based, right? Instead of like an old library Rolodex, um, a database is going to have all of the information about the medium. So it's going to have you know, publication date and DOI and ISBN and, and all the copyright material. Um, and then you can search through it and access it. A subscription database is a database, unsurprisingly, that you need a license, paid license, in order to access. So sometimes libraries will give you free access to these subscriptions um, so that you can still access the, the content. So these are things like certain academic journals, you need to have a license or a membership. Um, I mean, academics is usually, <laughs> that's my example, <laughs> academic licenses, uh, things like JSTOR. You can't just go onto JSTOR and download any paper you want. Um, you have to have a membership if you want to get access for free to see the content because it's not really for free because you're paying for the membership, right? An abstract. <laughs> so in general terms, an abstract thing, if something is abstract, it means it's not concrete, it's not physical, it's not um, measurable, it is a concept, okay? So abstract things would include, you know, your feelings are abstract, right? Whereas your brain is concrete, yeah? So in academics, an abstract is the concept of your paper. It's going to be a little overview um, of the paper. It's going to introduce the topic and the question that you were asking, as well as your general findings. Okay, so it's a little summary, a little blurb. This appears at the top of any research paper. Um, it's a good way to check whether the paper is going to be relevant for you. Methodology, which I've already mentioned slightly, methodology is the term for how you access, obtain, and interpret your information. Okay. So if you're thinking about, let's say, an experiment, the methodology would be how do you, did you run that experiment? Um, were there controls? What was your sample size? Um, what type of analysis did you run? Okay. There are two kind of categories of sources here, okay? So there's primary sources and secondary sources. Primary sources are direct accounts from people that witnessed or had an immediate connection with the thing that they're talking about, okay? If you think about court, <laughs> if you've ever watched a trial or are interested in law at all, um, when they say hearsay, it's because it wasn't primary, okay? A witness can only testify to things that they themselves experience. That's primary source. Okay. A secondary source is compiled by somebody else or some group of other people, but it's taking the primary sources and then combining them and maybe interpreting them, talking about them. Okay. So primary source, if we're talking, let's say history, primary source would be a diary and a secondary source would be a textbook or a, um, you know, a, just a history book, regular history book. Okay. Both sources obviously have benefits to them and are useful for different things. Okay, um, types of sources, what are they? I'm just gonna leave this on screen for a second if you are interested in some different types of reference books, if you wanna get creative with your sources instead of just finding um, little articles online. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can access and kind of learn from in different forms. Okay, um, notes on the types of sources. So both primary and secondary sources have value. You do wanna include both, 
Okay. Um, just because a source lacks some kind of authoritative qualities that we're going to talk about, it doesn't mean the source is bad or untrustworthy or shouldn't be used. You want to have a range of sources, but you want to be honest with both yourself and your reader about the value of that source, how reliable it is, how robust it is, um, and where you found it, right? Um, obviously, talking to, you know, let's say, um, interviewing a celebrity, that's a primary source about them, right? Talking to them directly versus talking to a fan of theirs or even a family member of theirs, right? Those are no longer, well, they're still kind of primary sources, but they're not as direct. So you have to kind of think about how many layers has this gone through? How many times has this been rethought of? Um, and yeah, we're going to look at some qualities that sources should have. So you're going to evaluate your sources on a couple of different categories. First, the authorship, the date, how recent is it? Has there been new work since? Is it out of date? What support your source has within it internally? So what sources does the source use? What the publisher is and what that implies um, and the writing style as well. Okay, so let me go slightly into these slightly more. Actually, no, I'm not because I, I'm pretty sure I talked about it in the citation lecture. So I'm gonna skip over it, try and keep things brief. Ooh, got a video loading. Um, try and stay on track here. Watch the citation lecture. Okay, this is a um, strategy from the textbook on evaluating your sources. Okay, and they call it CARS. So that's credibility, accuracy, reasonableness, and support. Um, so that's just another way of considering uh, the aspects of your source and whether it's a good source, how much you should trust it, how much stock you should put in its conclusions. All right, so bad things, <laughs> things that should give you a red flag. And this is something that you can use when you're just online existing as well. Say maybe you see someone share a news article with you. Well, you can have a think about this and see if it has any of these red flags. So if something is not credible, it might have anonymous materials or anonymous sources, um, negative reviews or feedback, negative comments, and language errors. If there are language errors in it, it's probably not a professional source. Inaccuracy. Maybe the date is not there <laughs> or the date is old and so there's new material that should have been addressed. If they're making generalizations or using big abstract terms, um, and if they don't adequately address their opposition, if they say, oh, so-and-so was wrong, but I'm not going to tell you how, um, that's not a very valid source, or at least it's not a robust one. If things are unreasonable, so maybe the language is really emotional, really extreme, maybe it's attacking a person instead of an idea, maybe there's a conflict of interest here. So maybe it's an oil company saying that oil tankers are safe for coral reefs, right? That's a conflict of interest, okay? Inconsistencies, contradictions internally, and of course, if it's not supported. So there's statistics or charts that do not have adequate um, like labeling or do not have sources. Um, there's not adequate quoting and it doesn't refer to its own sources and it doesn't declare when it's done research and when they haven't and when it's just from their own um, their own background. Author credibility. So some things to look at for authorship. First of all, who are they, <laughs> right? Who are they generally? And then you're going to look at why are they a good person to be talking about this topic? So what's their education and what's their experience? If we're looking at something about, you know, medicine, I want to read what medical doctors have to say. I want to read what um, the people who research in that specific disease have to say, right? 
I want people who have both the academic and the on-site experience to adequately and accurately talk about the topic. I want to look at their associations. Are they being paid by anybody for this interview? Um, is, you know, are they um, publishing under a university? Um, have they been, you know, associated with a public university? Are they associated with a weird private college that doesn't have um, accreditation, accreditation, I can't talk, um, like, you know, certain private colleges in the States that, you know, have like faith um, proclamations instead of um, regular research agreements, okay? Um, do are they involved in any professional organizations, guilds? Are they involved in the community, right? Are they on the board or of anything? Like, what are they associated with? And is that a conflict or does that support their um, knowledge and experience in this field? And of course, do they have other publications? What have they said before? Um, are they used to talking about this? Have they been researching this for 20 years and publishing about it every year? Or is it their first foray into the subject, right? Things to consider. When you're considering the credibility of the publication, so for this, I mean where it appears. So if you're reading an article in a magazine, I'm talking about the magazine or the, um, the newspaper or the journal, whatever the smaller work is appearing in the publisher, okay, who published it. So first of all, what type is it? Is it a popular magazine article or is it an academic article? Those are gonna have different levels of credibility and detail. Has it been peer reviewed? If it's in an academic journal, the answer is yes. That's the highest standard that you're looking for. That's what you want. Um, the more important your research, the more important it is that it's been peer reviewed. Editorial boards, that's who's on the board, who does the peer review, who decides what's published. Are they affiliated with anybody? So is this an independent publication? Is it affiliated with the school? Is it affiliated with a business? Is it affiliated with any kind of activist groups? Do you agree with those groups? Is it affiliated with a political group? And so on. History of the publication, how long has it been around? Um, what does it usually publish? And reviews, does it provide reviews within the further um, publisher. So like, is there an article and a response? Um, are reviews allowed? And what do other people in the community say about the publication generally? Quoting versus copying. Okay, so you are allowed and in fact encouraged to take information from other sources and incorporate it into your work, right? Um, it's like that Newton quote, if I've seen further than others, it's because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. So you've got to recognize those giants and give them some credit, um, but they want you to climb up there, right? That's the whole point. So a quote is any language that is taken directly and precisely from a source. It hasn't been changed. It's exactly word for word the same. To do this properly, you have to put it in quotation marks, okay? So indicate with punctuation that it has been taken from elsewhere. It needs to be blended into your own sentence. So not just plopped in there willy-nilly, it needs to be blended into your own sentence and it needs to have proper, proper citation, okay? Copied material is a quote without citation and proper punctuation. It's pasted into your own work and is in plagiarism. Please watch the academic integrity video um, for more about that. Okay. When you are selecting quotations, you want to remember this is going to be blended into your own work. If you can summarize what they're saying in your own words, do that. <laughs> Whenever possible, put it into your own language. Use your own words. Okay. But if they have said something in a really strong, compelling way, maybe they've used a really good image um, or just really great description, that's when you wanna pull that quotation and use it. So you're looking for strong images, strong phrases, strong examples, um, the best of the best of your source, okay? If you can write it in your own words, you should, but if you can't, or if theirs is just so much better, 
then that's when you wanna pull the direct quote. If you're going to cite something, make sure that the source agrees with the point that you're making. Otherwise it's called quote mining and is considered very, very bad practice, okay? So you never wanna misrepresent your source um, by taking quotes out of context or something like that. It needs to be accurate um, or your point needs to be supported by the entirety of the work, not just the quotation that you've taken. Unless you're arguing against it, obviously. Paraphrasing is what is usually encouraged. And this is when you put the information into your own words, use your own language for it, and sum up the information from the source. This still requires a citation. Okay. Um, it always requires a citation, but it doesn't require any fancy formatting or anything like that, like a quote does. So when I've said that the quote needs to be integrated into your own writing, what do I mean by this? I mean that any quotation, any phrase that you're taking should be blended into a larger sentence of your own. You should be able to then read that sentence out loud without acknowledging that there's a quote and it should be grammatically correct. You can make little changes to quotes in order to make it grammatically correct with the rest of the sentence or the rest of your work. So maybe you need to change the tense of something. Let's say you're doing a fiction work. You always talk about characters in fiction and events in fiction in the present tense, but your piece of fiction was written in past tense. Maybe you need to change that tense. That would be allowed. Maybe you need to put in an extra word to clarify something because it's missing a pronoun or it has a pronoun and you need the noun, um, et cetera. You want to change your sentence before you change the quote. Changing the quote is your last resort, but you can do it. You use square, um, square brackets. If you are interested in this, we can talk about it. Um, I can talk about grammar for the rest of my life. So um Let's chat about it in office hour if, if you are having any issues with integrating your quotes. So regarding changing quotations, again, this should only be done as a last resort after you changed your own writing to try and accommodate it. This should only be done to clarify things. Um, so provide information that is missing because you're taking the quote away from the rest of it. Um, or for grammatical reasons, again, to make it work with the sentence. So changes are done in square brackets. And these can be things like tense, subject verb agreement, um, clarifying pronouns. Like I was saying, maybe it says she, but you don't know who she is. So you need to put the name in. Um, shortening, if it's really long or if there's like a bit in the middle that you don't need, you can put some ellipses there. Um, or you might need to add articles or pronouns like my, hers, that kind of thing. Block quotes. So if you are quoting something that's longer than three lines, okay, which should only be done if the text is extremely excellent, right? Um, I'm talking about essays here for your presentations. You can put a block quote on the screen if you want, um, but then just focus on the, the key points, right? But for an essay, you want to avoid having a bunch of block quotes because then you're not writing anything yourself. But it, it can be useful. So if you need to quote something longer than three lines on the page, you need to format it as a block, which is indented um, away from the rest of the writing. Again, if you want to see this in person, if you have any questions about the formatting, um, chat with me. We can look at it together. I can show you some examples. If your work is short, it should not have block quotes in it. This is only appropriate in a longer work. Okay. Um, oh, also, if you've been given a word count, quotations don't count, okay? Block quotes do not count in um, word counts. And some professors do not count internal, like in integrated quotes in word count either, although that's more difficult. Okay. So just keep that in mind. So guidelines for quotes, they should not take up more space than your own words, your own words and your own writing should take precedence, should always be blended into your own writing. And if you're including a quote, especially a block quote, you've got to explain in text why you did so. 
So you need to provide context for the quote, then give the quote, and then provide commentary on the quote. Okay, so what does this quote show? What are you telling me about it? What are what are we illustrating? How does this support your argument? Okay, a search engine. <laughs> this is just a little tool um, that I'm including because again, study guide. So if you have taken um, ITC with me, you'll know all about search engines. Um, later on in the course, you are gonna be assigned my lecture on the intro to the internet where I'm gonna talk about search engines in more depth. But for now, a search engine is a software tool that allows um, you, the human, to search for, open, and look at objects online. So any kind of media online, any kind of web content, whether that's a picture or a website or an article, the engine maintains its own database, so you will get different results on different engines. They're maintained by programs called spiders. Um, there's a whole lecture on them. Check that out, intro to the internet. So there are some tips that they give you for using search engines. Gonna again, leave this on screen for a second. Um, I would come back to this list after you've seen your intro to internet video. Um, but essentially there are ways to optimize your search, give it a little more information um, about which words you're looking at, what queries are the most important. Okay. We did it. <laughs> we got all the way through. Uh, that is chapter four, research. Hopefully you have already watched the intro to citations um, and the academic integrity video. If you haven't, go do that now. Um, and I will see you for the next subject. Alrighty. Bye.